Expanding minds and hearts to reach for the reality of heaven. This is Fathom Ministries Podcast. Hi, I'm Nathan Reynolds. Welcome to another Bible lesson that I hope you find inspiring and informative. Please look for the handout link for this study in the description box down below. God bless you. What we're going to do is show you an amazing video of a, it's a movie that's been put out recently, and it's going to be shown to you in three parts. So we're going to take tonight and the next two weeks and show you it in pieces and do some of the teaching around it with the time we have left uh, of the hour. I hope that this video will stir your heart as it has mine, and that it will really make you think about the times that we're in. We're in the last days, and we're seeing the church enter into a phase that was predicted. It's called the apostate phase. And this is what we're going to be talking about. So 2000 years ago, it was the close of an age. And if you would momentarily look at the chart that I sent you that was included in this, which says the church at the end of the apostolic age, there are parallels we're expecting to be followed in the last words from Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. And this chart that I made for you tonight Uh, shows the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And if you know anything about that book, you realize that um, the book of Revelation is divided up into three parts. And it talks about the things that were, the things that are, which is what the church's condition was at the time it was written in 90 AD or so. And John, the last living apostle, the last living of the 12 disciples of Jesus who wrote the gospel of John, and he wrote first, second, and third John and the book of Revelation. This man has left us the testimony of Jesus himself. That's why it's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. Some people say it wrong, and they say the revelation of John. It's not the revelation of John. It was John who revealed what Jesus revealed to him. So when you look at this chart, what it basically is doing, and we're going to spend more time on this particular chart and the details of it and more than this uh, probably next week with regards to the movie that I'm going to show you. But what you see here is the weaknesses that Jesus points out in the churches. And here's the part I wanted to impact you with as you get ready to hear this video, because this video I'm going to show you is, it was uh, so alarming to me when I saw it, I I was shocked. I I see the condition of the world. We talk about it all the time. I share videos with you about it. And we can see the the globalism coming. We can see the the one world government coming. We can see the one world uh, money and bank coming and even digital currency, which is going to turn into what's called the mark of the beast. This is all obvious. But what I'm going to show you in the next three weeks is not as obvious, and it's even more shocking because it has to do with the church. So I wanted to inject us with this little bit of information from Revelation chapter 2 and 3, because Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are all about the church. And, And as I've told you before, The church is not listed in the book of Revelation in chapter 4 all the way to to chapter 19. You won't find the church in the earth. And that's because the church is in here. The rapture takes place. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 is an enactment that shows you the rapture as John is taken up into heaven as the one who acts out what the rapture is going to be like. And the reason that there's no church mentioned, that is the word church mentioned, from Revelation 4 all the way to until you get to Revelation 19, it's because those chapters are about the things to come, which is the latter uh, a category of what the book of Revelation says when it opens up and 
John shows us the categories of that book. The things that are, I mean, the things that were, which is past tense, the things that are, which is present tense. And then Jesus says, I'm going to show you the things to come. And that's why I call my series on prophecy things to come. That's where that comes from. So in Revelation, we have the last word to the church. And by the way, it was the last word to the church at the end of the apostolic age. What do I mean by apostolic age? The age that the apostles were alive in and had authority in. All 12 apostles had a special authority that is only equaled by the word of God, the Bible itself. And in those days, if an apostle made a decision, he would tell you what Jesus told them to do, and that would carry the same weight today as we look to Scripture, and we pay attention to what the Bible says. No living human, no living minister has the authority that's equal to what the apostles had, but the authority that we have today is solely Scripture. That is it. Any, uh, anything that a minister or a pastor has in terms of authority only is that which is derived from Scripture, and their authority is limited to what Scripture says it is, because the foundation of everything is Scripture. The Scripture that we have today is the only thing that's perfect. There isn't a human that's perfect. There's no preacher that has perfect theology. There's no saint in a church that has perfect theology. Uh, only the Bible can be that which is perfect. And that is the wonderful thing about it. The perfect has come and it is scripture. But the thing that's emphasized uh, that will help us to understand what we need to understand about this particular night, about what I'm going to show you in two videos, is that the condition of the church matches what it matched at the end of the apostolic age. And if you look quickly at this chart, you'll see seven uh, rows because there's seven churches, and then I have all the listings there of where these particular churches are addressed. And like I said, later we will go into the details because there's so much to glean from that. But I just want you to notice that the second church and the sixth church, which is Smyrna and Philadelphia, they did not have any spiritual weaknesses that Jesus was rebuking them for. So what, do, what does that tell us? That tells us there's seven churches, but five of them have some severe weaknesses that are jeopardizing their continuation as churches in the hands of Jesus Christ. The body of Christ, five out of seven, were in trouble. And they were in trouble in many ways in the same ways. But the diversity of their trouble matches what the church is going to be like in the last days at the end of the church age. So we're dividing this into church age versus apostolic age. The apostolic age was very unique, and it started the church age. But the end of the church age is also unique because God has to bring alive the ministers who are going to tell us and understand for us prophecy that has been spoken and not understood for the last 2,000 years because it took us to get to the rebirth of Israel in order to have the key that unlocks end-time prophecy for us now. The church before 1948 and there before there was an Israel, the church had a Bible that referenced Israel all the time, talked about the promises to Israel, talked about all these things, but it sounded like it was completely dead because there was no Israel. There was no country of Israel. There were Jews scattered all over the world, but there was no place where all the Jews lived. This is what was the key that unlocked the door. So in this chart that I'm giving you here to look at just as a brief overview, I just want to make the emphasis here that all of the churches except for two were in trouble. And tonight, what I'm going to show you is that American churches are in this same situation, and that's why you can hardly find a church that don't have a red flag where it looks like it's about to lose all life because they are not in compliance with the Word of God. They are not lined up with the Word of God. So without further ado, we're going to share a screen with you, and we're going to show you what I'm talking about here. 
When I look at history, the Western church we see right now hardly resembles the empty shell of what it once was. My name is Kerry Gordon. I'm three generations deep in full-time Christian ministry. My grandfather, Dr. R.M. Mounts, preached the gospel for more than 60 years before he died. By the time that this movie is released, my own father, Dr. Larry Gordon, will have preached the gospel of the kingdom for more than 50 years. This is my 27th year of pastoring in Sioux City, Iowa. I understand ministry and I love ministry. I am a published author. I have conducted hundreds of media interviews concerning the intersection of faith and politics in the United States. Shucks, I've even been known to pop up on occasion in documentary movies. But why would the pastor of a moderately sized church built on top of a hill in the western Iowa cornfields do those kinds of things? Because I recognize the trajectory of western culture and I know what my kids and my grandkids are going to be facing long after I'm dead and buried if I don't do everything I can to fight against it. I am passionate about Jesus Christ. I am passionate about his beloved church. I am passionate about the Bible. I love my congregation. I am passionate about the God-granted gift of the nuclear family. I love my wife. I love all of my six children. I like being a dad. Why? Because I'm a generational thinker as the Bible teaches all Christians ought to be. Like the good men, for example, who drafted the US Constitution, who included the words, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Posterity being a fancy word for children and grandchildren. I see and understand the unavoidable consequences that past generations have brought upon themselves through error. I have studied history and reviewed the obituaries piled up in the tomb of lost empires. I love America with all of my heart. I know that something is terribly, terribly wrong with Western civilization. I can hear the death rattle. I can see the handwriting on the wall. I have heard this question asked by every stripe of man and woman on both sides of every political debate, of every social controversy. What on earth is going on? What has happened to our society? The question everyone should be asking right now is this, what happened to the church? How's everybody doing? Can you see what this is? This is a puzzle. It's a 35 piece ABC floor puzzle for ages three and up. What I'm gonna do this morning is I'm gonna ask you to allow me to say a few things you've already heard. I've given you some puzzle pieces, but today I'm gonna start snapping them together. So you're gonna need them. When you get a puzzle piece, you don't say, oh, that's nice. I don't need that anymore. No, you need these puzzle pieces. You need to take them again in your hand and let me snap them together. And by the end of the service, if you'll let the Holy Spirit help you, I think you're gonna see something fresh you haven't seen before. We'll come back and talk about puzzles in a minute. We do live in a puzzling time, don't we? June 29th and 30th, 2010, Opinion Dynamics had conducted a scientific national poll and it revealed that 78% of Americans believed the founding fathers would be unhappy with our condition as a nation today. In a chilling recent survey, I'm, when I say recent, about three years ago, 58% of respondent millennials, now that's young persons in their middle 20s to about 40 years old, right in there. 58% of them said they did not want free markets in America. They don't want capitalism. They overwhelmingly said they preferred socialism, fascism, or communism. You could lump all three of those categories together. They don't agree on things, but they do agree on this. They are statists. The state gives permission for the individual to exist. And what did the founding fathers believe? They said, no, that is wrong. The individual person created in the image of God gives permission for the state to exist. 
So here's the question. How do you go from living in a country where a huge supermajority at one time apparently cared about what their founding fathers would think to a great big supermajority today that firmly believed that the founding fathers were completely wrong and we need to be communists? How do you do that in 11 years? Over the last three and a half years, this has been the question that we've been preparing to answer as a movie crew. How do you go from point A to point B so quickly? What is going on right now in our country, in our own city, is puzzling. And speaking of puzzles... Something happened to me when I was a kid, and I'll never forget it. We would go over to my grandmother's house. So one of the things that we would do when we got bored, she would say, pick a puzzle. And so you'd go over and select something and snap it together. And when you looked at the box top, you could see what the puzzle should look like when it's fully assembled. But something happened. Somebody had scrambled up the box tops. So for an entire afternoon, we were just frustrated trying to put this puzzle together because we were looking at the wrong box top while trying to snap together the right pieces. A journey like the one that we're engaged in to create this documentary film is really similar to that in many ways. As we've traveled across the United States, we've met with so many people and conducted so many hundreds of hours of interviews and each one of them has given us a significant piece to this puzzle. But there was one interview in particular at the very beginning of the journey that proved to be very significant because this man had the correct box top view of what we were trying to assemble. I think a lot of Christians need to understand the heritage of the United States. Now, re the, the actual representative government that founded America uh, it comes out of Mosaic law. When Moses was leading the people out of Egypt, he was constantly besieged by complaints and people coming to him, driving him crazy. So he said, go amongst you and choose representatives, which they did, which cut down Moses's workload quite considerably. And then when the United States was founded, it was founded on the concept that human rights came directly from God to the people who could then choose representatives to form a government which would protect those rights. So do you think such a system might have enemies? Do you think all the tyrants of the world might be very upset at a system whereby the rights came from God and bypassed the rulers and went straight to the people? Even before the Bolshevik revolution, American communists and socialists were plotting to bring this country down. And one of the very first communist fronts formed in America, the Methodist Federation for Socialist Action, was formed by Professor Harry Ward from Union Theological Seminary. And he spread communist doctrines right through the Protestant churches in America. Now the enemies of America understood that America was a very strong country and that the churches were the backbone of America. So how are you gonna destroy America? You have to do it from the inside and you have to get inside the churches. I had a friend, um, he was a communist investigator. He was a former communist party member, Herb Bromerstein. He said the softest touches, the easiest people to manipulate by the communist party were Protestant pastors because they were primed for it. Well, it was a man called Joseph Fletcher who taught at the Episcopal Theological College at Harvard University for many years. He was a longtime activist, and he was the man who helped to set up Planned Parenthood. He helped to set up the Right to Die Society. His wife worked very closely with Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. And in his later years, he became a leader of the field of bioethics which is basically how to justify abortion and euthanasia. In 1966, he wrote a book called Situation Ethics, and it took the, the Christian world in America by storm because it was all about there is no fixed morality. Your morality depends on the situation, the circumstances that you are in. 
And for people who were really wanted to abandon the, old, the morality of the Old Testament, this was a great justification. Now this gentleman was one of the most influential Christians in the United States. But for most of his career, he was an active supporter of the Communist Party USA. He worked very closely with the Communist Party in Boston. He was a member of the World Peace Council, which was the main Soviet front at the time. So he worked for Stalin. This man worked for Stalin, one of the greatest butchers the world has ever seen. Yet he became one of the most influential theologians in America, the man who transformed the church to accept the idea that, that ethics were flexible. Now, after he wrote that book, after a lifetime of communist and theological activism, he abandoned Christianity, became an open atheist, and advocated for things such as the forced euthanasia of children up to the age of nine or 10. So what you're saying is, one of the most influential Christian theologians in America became an avowed atheist publicly. Yes. And was supporting eugenics, like what you see in the book Mein Kampf, written by Adolf Hitler. Absolutely. He, he held human life in no regard. Abortion was perfectly acceptable. Euthanasia was perfectly acceptable. In the communist society, you are not a human being. You are a cog in a machine. Life is, is only worth what it can produce for the collective. After I first met with Trevor Loudon, I felt like I really had a pretty good broad view of what was really going on in the United States. But I still needed to snap the pieces together. There is a history to the movement we're seeing now, and here's what happened. In the early 1970s, Christianity, evangelicalism in particular, was going down a path to social justice. It started in campus radical movements, mostly in the 1960s, uh, Richard Mao uh, in the reform, the Dutch reform tradition, ends up getting radicalized in college and starts to walk away from his Christian faith. But he reads uh, The Uneasy Conscience of Modern Fundamentalism, finds out that there's a way to base his new left ideas on a Christian framework. The premier institution for neo-evangelicalism is what they called what Carl Henry came up with, was Fuller Theological Seminary. So this seminary started changing their focus from understanding the Bible and communicating it to souls to now transforming social structures, creating a new movement. People like Ron Sider, Jim Wallace, John Alexander, Sharon Gallagher, Samuel Escobar, and the list goes on, came together in 1973, and they put together what was called the Chicago Declaration on Evangelical Social Concern. Here's a portion of the Chicago Declaration. We must attack the materialism of our culture and the maldistribution of the nation's wealth and services. We recognize that as a nation, we play a crucial role in the imbalance and injustice of international trade and development. Before God and a billion hungry neighbors, we must rethink our values regarding our present standard of living and promote a more just acquisition and distribution of the world's resources. They were academics. They were people who worked for the government. They were elites and working class people rallied around Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and people like that. If you think our solution is political, you too have been deceived. Don't you commit yourself to some political party or politician. You commit yourself to the principles of God and demand those parties and politicians align themselves with the eternal values in this book, and America will be forever the greatest nation on this earth. A moral majority, religious right formed, and they took the nation by storm and stole all the headlines. So it was an academic elitist movement, the social justice movement. They ended up going other places, mostly in academia. So they are now teaching. They're under the radar. They're not getting the headlines the religious right's getting but they're still present. They didn't all die. They didn't go away. They kept doing what they were doing and they taught it in places like Wheaton College and Fuller Theological Seminary. And the next generation of academics and pastors have been taught at their feet. Now the communist goal is to overthrow 
every government and run the world. We are its main competitor. And given that Christianity has been our chief source of strength throughout the centuries, that absolutely had to go. That had to be discredited, undermined, smeared, and utterly destroyed before they could present us with their alternative. The communists have always been looking for inroads. So about the 1920s, and this is after the Soviet revolution in Russia, they started infiltrating seminaries. They targeted various religious orders. They targeted the Franciscans, they targeted the Benedictines, uh, but they primarily targeted the Jesuits. And because the Jesuits were very, very highly educated, they used a lot of their education and their their high, highly developed philosophy in order to hide what they were really teaching. Ballard Dodd, who was a member of the American Communist Party back in the 30s, she was in the teachers' unions in New York. She talked about how she had helped to bring 1,100 young communists into the Catholic Church. She said that by the time she got out, which was about 20 or 30 years later, she had seen many of those young men raised to the rank of bishop and even cardinal. So what we're seeing happen right now has already happened before, and it's happened in the Catholic Church. Without a doubt. And, and one of the things that I think cannot be emphasized enough is that the primary mode of promoting socialism within the Catholic Church, and now you're seeing it in the Protestant community, is through social justice initiatives. What is a communist front? What is a socialist front? It's an organization that purports to do one thing but has a significant number of leaders involved or enough leaders to actually push it in another direction. I booked a flight to Washington, D.C. to attend my first CPAC. I'll never forget the words that I read in a book that I happened to have along with me in my lap to pass the time of travel. Apparently, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, the communist regime, had been studying America for about 20 years. They were studying to figure out what it was that was ultimately responsible for the unprecedented success of the United States. An official of the Atheist Communist Chinese Academy of Social Sciences said the following words in summary of their 20-year study of the West. And I quote, we studied everything we could from the historical, political, economic, and cultural perspective. At first, we thought it was because you had more powerful guns than we had. Then we thought it was because you had the best political system. Next, we focused on your economic system. But in the past 20 years, we've realized that the heart of your culture is your religion, Christianity. That is why the West is so powerful. The Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life was what made possible the emergence of capitalism and then the successful transition to democratic politics. We do not have any doubt about this." End quote. Consider the irony the Chinese communists are looking at the correct box top of the jigsaw puzzle of the West, while a growing majority of Americans are looking at the wrong one. Is justice an important word for a Christian? Well, absolutely. If it's social justice, that's justice that's defined by society. If it's biblical justice, it's justice that's defined by God. What God does in his word, he holds us accountable as individuals. Social justice wants to obliterate that and instead hold governments and people accountable for the choices and decisions of other governments and other people. Social justice is a euphemism for uh, Marxism. Fairness, the same basic outcomes. You know, if, if, if you're a billionaire, then I should be a billionaire. And so many of our churches, and especially our urban churches, they're encouraging people to look at the things of this world mm -hmm. and bemoan the relative position mm. that we have within our community and look at all these other communities. 
You know, it's sold as in a way to improve people's lives, to give people more security, to, to help people. It's not, it's a way to enslave them. It's a way to mislead them. And it's a way to give certain unscrupulous people way more power than they ever should have. In two short years after the communist Chinese study was released to the public, I mean, they shared it everywhere. Another communist regime in the Far East led by the infamous Kim Jong-un rounded up as many as 80 Christians took them into stadiums, packed the stadiums with 10,000 men, women, and children, tied them to posts, and killed them with a machine gun, forced men, women, and children to watch. Why? Well, because they had a Bible. You know, one of these. They were caught with one of these in their house. Two of the largest communist regimes on planet Earth had recently acknowledged that the Bible was and is the source of the strength of the free market arch enemy, America. One recognized that an honestly read and interpreted Bible is so anti-Marxist, this book is so anti-socialist, this book is so anti-statist, this book is so anti-communist that anyone found with it in their possession should clearly be executed. And they needed to be executed publicly in front of the whole nation to discourage anyone else from reading its dangerous anti-communist comments. Meanwhile, in floundering America, your clergymen in growing chorus are showing less honesty and integrity than communist authorities on the other side of the ocean by telling the next generation of American activists that Jesus was a socialist and that socialism is a legitimate tool of Christian compassion? They have switched the box tops. They are lying. We're hearing pastors saying these things. We're hearing them using terms like intersectionality, critical race theory, systemic racism, etc. Then you're bringing that into the church, Black Lives Matters and so forth. Normally, it would be the church that is in opposition to what's happening in the society, and instead, what you see is a melding of things now. Lion King, everybody saying Lion King? You got Simba, a lion, Timon, a meerkat, and Pumbaa, a warthog. What in the world are they doing together? How is it that they are kicking it and have become a beloved community? Well, Simba, the lion, has to become a vegetarian. Whites have to become a vegetarian to their privilege and sacrifice privilege for the sake of the whole. White privilege is a misnomer, uh, especially for all of us in the United States. Uh, everybody born in the United States is privileged. I'm supposed to buy the idea that a person is my oppressor and I am their victim because their skin is one color, my skin is another color. I mean, that's the message it's trying to send. Where did the term white privilege come from. It came from the Maoist movement. It came from Ted Allen and Noel Ignatin. They were two Communist Party members who moved from the pro-Russian camp into the pro-Chinese camp. And they invented this term white privilege. Go back to the Maoist revolution, the cultural revolution in China in the 60s. Remember the pictures of people who would be in front of big sessions and they'd have a sign around their neck, capitalist, mm -hmm. you know, because their father was a business owner. Right. They could never escape the taint of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea was to create a new culture where, where people could be much more easily manipulated because you create this enemy. Mm. And the enemy was the capitalist. Well, now the enemy is the white person who has white privilege. So everybody's out there competing amongst themselves to denounce those with white privilege. Whiteness is a dysfunctional system, that it is a pathology that poses a danger to the fabric of our democracy if left unchecked. I want to sacrifice more of my preferences as a white pastor. I need to grow. I do not want to speak from the Bible on issues that are popular among white followers of Christ while staying silent in the Bible on issues that are important to non-white followers of Christ. And so I feel like until all white people 
and I, I say all <laughs> white people, look within themselves and say, God, where is the deceitfulness in my heart? Where have I bought into the narrative that all black people are criminals? Where am I treating my neighbor uh, not as better than myself? Where am I assuming that I am superior and they are inferior mm -hmm. because of the color of my skin? I am sorry. I have grieved you because That's they're good. made in your image. That's good. And also, too, we have to understand that white guilt is not repentance. In America, it is very clear to me that the millennial generation in particular is very frustrated and even angry as they try to put the broken pieces of our once great society back together again with a completely inverted vision for what America is supposed to look like when they get finished. But this time, it's different. This time, the puzzle box top was swapped deliberately. And it was the Christian church in an effort to appease the spirit of the age, they swapped the biblical vision for a just society with an artificial, humanistic, relativistic, false gospel designed to please the flesh of sinful men. Rather than confront the problem of sin that resides in the ruined soul of every sinner and provide the solution for its necessary punishment, which is the powerful work of the cross of Jesus Christ, and what it really means. Instead of that, in an effort to attract and coddle and pacify the wicked without confrontation of God's law against man's sin, they changed the truth into a lie. Wow. I cannot wait to show you the rest of this uh, in the next couple of weeks. There is uh, an incredible thing that's happening in the church and it's going to definitely split into two segments and what's going to happen is is that the church that is embracing the darkness of the world is going to become the prominent and accepted version of christianity prominent because the world will love them accepted because they will not make the world uncomfortable by standing up for biblical truth. And so what's coming in our future, which is going to be bad enough before the rapture, horrible after the rapture, uh, because in the end result, the rapture of the church is going to be the beginning of the first half of what's called the tribulation period. And that's a seven year period. And the seven, the three and a half years leading up to the middle of the tribulation period is a period of time that will be an increasing vice grip that's going to go around the neck of believers who are left. The only people that are going to be left in the world as the church when this happens are going to be non-believing professing Christians. And believe me, they're going to have some kind of explanation about the rapture of the church that is going to make them still look like they're the Christian community. And so what's going to happen, though, is, is that once people see that they've lost their souls by not going in the rapture, they're going to try to turn to true Christianity and when they do, they're going to face the wrath of Satan through the global government, which is going to culminate in the middle where they are going to start killing anyone who truly believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. The church won't be here, but there will be Gentiles and Jews that God is saving during this time of Jacob's trouble. And right in the middle of all of this, in Revelation 13, it says, that God is going to give this man the power to sit at the pinnacle of rule in the world for 42 months. Daniel says this, and Revelation says this in multiple ways. The beast, the Antichrist, the man of sin, all of these are the same person and the same government. And in Revelation 13, he is going to say he's God. And the world is going to say he's God. And they are going to take on them a mark, which is going to be associated with their bank 
and with their uh, economic system, their currency, which will be a digital currency, as we can see now, as it's developing. And the Bible called that digital currency 666, but that currency is going to called, be called like a cryptocurrency, and the whole world is going to unite behind this one idea, this one government, this one man, and they are going to do it in a way to worship. And at that point, for 42 months, is the time that Jesus and others spoke about, which tell us that this is going to be the worst time in the world to live. It's going to be a time of darkness that is so awful that there will be no evangelism being done by human beings, that there will only be evangelism being done by uh, angels, uh, because this time is going to be so dark. So the angels of God are going to go through the atmosphere, uh, declaring the gospel that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and to repent, and they're the ones who's going to do it, and I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that sounds like. We can only take the actual words from Scripture and, and, and see how that worked. But this was similar to what happened to Israel when they were brought to the mountain to hear the voice of God. And they heard the voice of God from the mountain. And the Bible describes this same scenario as people hearing the voice of God through the angels who are going to fly in the heavens, the atmosphere above us, and they're going to declare the gospel. But the Lord told us this time would be a time not of evangelism, but a complete shutdown, a literal killing of anyone who actually served the Lord. So what is, what is this going to look like from today? And what we're seeing now forward is a further filtration coming to the church to where there will be many churches split from those that they're talking about in this movie who are going along with the darkness of the world and they think it's enlightenment, social, social justice and the like. And all they're doing is they're, that the whole foundation of this whole movement is anger. It is great anger. And they are turning loose the devastating uh, impossibility of racism upon the whole face of the earth because you can't talk like they're talking boldly and openly uh, criticizing people based on the color of their skin. I mean, that's what we tried to fix for the last 200 years. And now they're just reversing it because they can, and they think there's wisdom in it and justice against certain people. And that there's some kind of elevation that is justified by other people of color, and that there's the balance going on. It is the same idea in the economic system where communism takes away and steals from the people who earn things, and they give it to people who haven't earned anything. And they think that that is great. And, and this convergence of what's happening, you guys, is amazing because they're talking about this even in the case of children. Uh, my daughter wants to have a child someday. She hopes that after she goes through cancer that they can have a kid. And I was talking to her the other day and I thought, you know what, by the time you get into the future, they're literally talking about the fact that you don't own your kids and that they're going to take away, like if you're a white couple, they want to take away your white kid that is privileged and uh, since it's coming into your life, it's, uh, it's rich in their eyes. So they want to take that child and they want to take it and put it in a home that is impoverished to balance out the fairness of uh, the fact that you have a white child. And then they want to take a child of color and they want to bring it and give it to you and, and exchange your child for that child so that that impoverished one can be raised in your household, which is rich. And then this is how they're going to fix justice and be fair. Now, there is absolutely nothing sensible, fair, or even logical about that. But that's what's going to happen. And in the church, what's going to happen is those of us who take the Bible literally and believe it literally and look at it as the one thing that has the power to demonstrate authority for our life and how we are to live our life, we are the ones who are going to be squeezed out. We're going to be labeled extremists, just like the Muslims 
have extremists and they're the ones who blow themselves up, we are going to be labeled along with them as extremists. And it's already happening in our country from our president this week, who has labeled everyone who supported Trump, who should have won the election. If you see or if you get a chance to, to see the movie uh, 2000 Mules, you'll see the evidence right there that uh, Dinesh D'Souza just put out this week. It is an amazing, amazing thing how they have subverted justice and they have uh, done so with boldness like never before. And our president has just called everyone who supports that side of the political front as extremists, as extremists. But the spirit behind this is not interested in only the politics of it, but the extremists behind this uh, is Satan who is generating this hatred and the hatred is going to go right down to where they used to be obvious, the Jews and the Christians. And it's going to come strongly against this, these two groups who are married with the uh, belief in the same God. So we have a, and the Christian side, a Judeo Christian point worldview and of course, on the Jewish side, they reject the Christian part of it, but they are the uh, Judeo side of that uh, impact. So what we have is we have an amazing thing going on, and the Bible foretold this is going to happen. What I think is going to happen is, is we're going to be shut out a little bit at a time. Uh, we're going to be shut out at church at some point because we're going to see our churches bring in teachers that we know are on the wrong side. They're going to be teaching these kind of things. And I, I tell you, we got to walk out of those churches. We got to, we got to put an end to our commitment financially and attending those kind of churches. It is not, to, you, you've got to draw a line and you've got to say no to that situation. It's impossible. I want to read to you what I forgot to read to you at the beginning, uh, Jude 3 and 4, that's on the handout. And we're just going to read the first uh, the, the, the verses here. And then I'm going to show you a seven minute video that's going to just another one that's going to blow your mind. The one I just showed you hasn't even got to the core yet. You won't believe what you're going to see next week. But here is the scripture that supports what I'm trying to focus your attention on. Jude 3 and 4. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ." This licentiousness goes to the heart of what is spoken of in that chart that I showed you earlier from the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, it talks many times, several times with several of the churches about the doctrines of uh, the Nicolaitan, the, the, the Nicolaitans and, the, and, and those who teach Balaam's doctrine and Jezebel, the woman who's given a right to teach in the church. These things bring in sexual sin. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a mix of two things, uh, a mixture of religion, in other words, Christianity and something else, idolatry, and a mixture of bringing in sexual immorality. The doctrine of Balaam was a, a mixing of religions. God had forbidden them to mix with the heathen because they would serve their idols. And so that's what the doctrine of Balaam represents in that in that those seven churches or the one that it mentions it for. But the other one is in two of them, and it's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which permitted sexual immorality and, and that that would be OK. What does this verse tell us? Contend earnestly for the faith. This is so important that we fight this, that we don't accept it that we don't feel helpless in our churches. I'm telling you, we got to find churches that support the Bible and do not give in to the spirit. Um, we'll read the rest later because I see that we're getting close to uh, the end of our hour. And I want to do this one more video. So please hold on for video two. It's uh, seven minutes, I think, long.
The reason why the church is messed up today isn't just because Christians are going south. Non-Christians are running the church. Behind the pulpit, worship teams, not here. Behind the pulpit, worship teams, even denominations are being steer-headed by non-Christians. That's why things are so messed up. So it's the coming great apostasy. It's another Bible prophecy sign that we need to do it. I would really call myself an agnostic. Um, I live my life the way I believe it should be lived, which is, as I said, very much uh, along Christian value lines. But yeah, I, I just don't, I'm not convinced. And quite frankly, I don't, uh, you know, I don't worry about it. I don't really care. I go to a church, I support the church and everything else. And, you know, I'm very much in favor of it. You know, I believe in strong morals that, uh, you know, I have strong family values and I want to bring that up with my children. Uh, I also have a belief that, you know, my views are my views and other people believe what they want to believe. And I don't want to get in arguments or try to convince them otherwise. Logically, intellectually, I have a hard time grasping that Christianity is necessarily right. I mean, why, and take Judaism, for example, why isn't that just another mythology? Why isn't that, I mean, the Romans had mythology, Greeks had mythology, so, you know, why isn't Christianity just another mythology? I mean, you look at Jesus Christ and you say, had to be a phenomenal human being, a phenomenal leader. He was able to, you know, call himself the son of God, you have a bunch of disciples and get a lot of people to believe that he was the son of God and to reaffirm their belief in God. And that then evolved historically into a, a great religion. My view of the uh, afterlife is there is none. Life ends um, when you die. And uh, you didn't exist beforehand and you will not exist afterward. Where's Larry? Larry's in the church. Can I tell you something? We've allowed Larry's to sit there comfortably because people don't preach the truth. It's all a bunch of fluff. And then Larry's have got so comfortable, they've now moved behind the pulpit. And now they've taken over. This is why things are so messed up, folks. And you don't need to justify, well, those Christians, that church went, that guy went south. Maybe the problem was they weren't saved in the first place. What? They're behind the pulpit? They're leading worship? Yes! Let me give you a couple of them. They admitted it off tape. Well, and they're from every denomination you can think of, right? Wes, he was a Methodist. He, he lost all confidence in the Bible while attending a liberal Christian college and seminary. He says, quote, I, I went to college thinking that Adam and Eve were real people. Uh, now he no longer believes that God exists. The church members do not know he's an atheist. In other words, he's lying to them. He explains that, uh, hey, they're somewhat liberal themselves. His colleagues, you know, they don't believe in a Jesus rose from the dead, literally. They don't believe Jesus was born of a virgin. They don't believe in all those things that would cause a big stir in churches, you know, sound doctrine. Rick, he's a campus minister for United Church of Christ. He was an agnostic in college, but he lost all belief by the time he went uh, through seminary. He chose, listen, ordination UCC because they required no forced doctrine. A lot of denominations, they'll take anything. C can you breathe? Okay, we'll hire you. That's how bad it is, folks. He says, he, he knew once he graduated, he says, quote, I I'm not going to make it in a conventional church. He knew he couldn't go into a church and teach his theological views. Why? Because they're not theology. He doesn't believe it. He's a faker. He doesn't believe in all this, quote, creedal stuff about the incarnation of Christ or the need of salvation. But he remains in the ministry. Why? Because these are my people. This is the context in which I work. These are the people that I know. And watch this. In the pulpit, his motive is to talk as if he does believe because, quote, as long as you're talking about God and Jesus in the Bible, and, and that's what they want to hear, but, but language is ambiguous. And... Yeah, but he, he's up there. He, he, he mentioned Jesus. He, he holds up the Bible. He, he says God a lot. He went to seminary. I don't care. Daryl, he's a Presbyterian, but he's progressive-minded, right, pastor? And he wants to see his, quote, non-doctrinal Christianity spread, give him validity. He acknowledges he's more of a pantheist, that all is God, than a theist. And he thinks many of the more educated members of his church hold the same liberal views of his own. And, and these beliefs are unbeliefs. He says, quote, I reject the virgin birth. I reject substitutionary atonement. I reject the divinity of Jesus. I reject heaven and hell. And I'm not alone. Where's he at? He's behind the pulpit. I can tell you stories so you're blue in the face, folks. This is what's 
going on in mass. Daryl, he's candid again. The reason why he's staying in there, well, if you don't believe this, what are you doing this for? It's a religious gig, folks, right? He does it for his family. He says, he, he says I, I may be burning bridges in terms of my ability to earn a living this way if I told him I really don't believe this. No. Adam, Church of Christ, after years of ministry, he lost all theological confidence. He moved into, quote, full atheist mode, and he continues to lead the church in worship. What? Watch this. He admits he's faking it. He's putting on a show, all right. Here's how I handle my job on Sunday mornings. I see it as, quote, play acting. Did you know that's the Greek word for hypocrite? Play actors? I see myself as taking on the role of a believer in worship service and, quote, performing. This atheist agnostic saves the ministry because he says, I still need the job. But he admits if I had an alternative source of income, he'd take it. He feels hypocritical, but he no longer believes that hypocrisy is wrong. <laughs> One more Southern Baptist. John, Southern Baptist minister. So he was a pastor, but he also served as a worship leader. He said, I was attracted to Christianity as a religion of love. But his pursuit of Christianity brought me to the point of not believing in God. He said, I didn't plan to become an atheist. Yes, you did. It's a choice. I didn't want to become an atheist. I just had no choice if I'm being honest with myself. He's not being honest with the church. He rejects all belief in God, all Christian truth claims out of hand. He's a determined atheist. And once again, he puts a price tag on it. He said, if someone said, hey, here's $200,000, I'd turn to my notice this week because I could pay off everything. This is going on in mass. You're sitting here, you and I are going, and this week here comes another church that goes south. Here's another denomination going along with this sick agenda or this or that and what we stop defending people who may not even be saved and even the lost can see this you don't need to defend it say you're right but i'll tell you why maybe it's because that person wasn't even saved right this goes on in mass and i'll, and I'll just share this i love this this was back in 1739 by gilbert Tennant. i love what he says about these phony <laughs> church leaders including preachers he said if they will not remove themselves from the ministry they must be removed if they lack the integrity to resign from the pulpit the churches must rise up the integrity to eject them so i got news for larry i don't believe what i want to believe Larry said he believes what he wants to believe and of everyone else believes what they want to believe. A long time ago, I realized what I need to believe is what God says, not what I want to believe. If I believe what I want to believe, I would be in a spiritual cul-de-sac and I would have been crashed a long time ago. I believe the Bible, especially the parts that I don't really like, or I don't really, it doesn't meet with my uh, taste, let's say. Um, there is no way that the church is going to get out of this mess this time. Because as you're going to see in the next video next week, uh, they have infiltrated the seminaries that churn out the ministers who lead the church. And they've been doing it for years. And I didn't know this. You're going to be shocked at what you find out when we get together next time. I want to close out by reading the rest of Jude, Jude 14 through 19, uh, that's on the paperwork. And I want to show you how it describes that this was going to happen. It says in verse 14, it was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam, talking about Enoch of Genesis, prophesied saying, behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things, which the ungodly sinners have spoken against him talking about God. Verse 16, these are grumblers finding fault following after their own lusts or desires. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, in the last time, there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the spirit. So tonight, think about this and think about what's happening 
by the spirit of the Antichrist, who is trying to infiltrate the church now because he wants to lead the masses into deception. The whole world is going to be in the hand of the evil one, the whole world. And we already see it happening. However, right now, not everyone's in there. I'm not in there. You're not in there. But we've got to guard ourselves to make sure that we don't end up there because it is a seducing spirit that it works just like a sexual seducing spirit. It is, it is a, hey, uh, let me entice you so I can own you, so I can uh, make sure that you can't get loose. There's a new phenomenon. It's not brand new. I, I know it's been around a while, but it's in the news this week and where young men are being enticed because they go to the wrong websites looking at pornography, by the way, which is a sin of idolatry. And so this is a big deal for the church, uh, especially for men uh, right now, because it is, uh, it, is, it is mixing your religious uh, affections for God and for false gods. But anyway, right now they're talking about how that these people are uh, posing as girls, young girls, and they're getting these young men to send pictures and videos of themselves in sexual situations. And then when they do it, they turn around and they blackmail them and they tell them they're going to post these things or expose these things on them if they don't pay a certain sum of money. And this is exactly what the devil's scheme is in a broad sense. And that is he's trying to allure us through false things that uh, attach themselves to our affections. That's why you don't want to be in a Christian setting that is extreme in emotions and that everything is defined by the emotional side, because the emotions have a tendency to completely uh, destroy your vision and able to see what it is that's behind the situation. Um, so as we see in Jude, it tells us that in the last time, which we are in now, because we're at the end of the church age, in the last time, there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lust, affections. They're going after what they want to believe. And this is exactly what Larry said. He goes, you all believe what you want to believe. And I say, no, I don't believe what I want to believe. I believe what God says, and that's where it's going to stay. I'm not going to ask myself, do I like what God says? Because it's the truth, and I've got to live with what God says. And so in the last days, this is what's going to happen. This is happening. And uh, so next week, we will, uh, we will proceed and get to part two of this Enemies Within the Church uh, documentary. You've been listening to a Fathom Ministries podcast with me, Pastor Nathan Reynolds. If this ministry is beneficial to you and your walk with the Lord, please consider a monthly donation to our ministry effort by clicking on the donate link in the description area on this video or podcast. Our website link is www.fathomministries.org. This will take you directly to our YouTube channel where you can find more content just like this. Thank you for listening and supporting this ministry.